ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Christian Scherer to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation luncheon today. Uh, Christian is uh, Chief Executive Officer at ATR. ATR is a leading manufacturer of advanced turboprop aircraft. The company sold nearly 1,700 aircraft to 200 operators around the world. And prior to his position at ATR, Christian was Executive Vice President and head of Airbus Group International. In his role, he's been responsible for driving the overall Airbus Group interna internationalization strategy. He also served as head of marketing and sales of Airbus Defense and Space, and was head of sales and international operations of Cassidian. Christian is a member of the BDLI Presidium, the German Aerospace uh, Industries Associations, and he chaired the BDLI's Defense and Security Forum. In March, at our annual meeting, uh, we were honored uh, to have Christian join the Wings Club Board of Governors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christian Scher. The floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much indeed. Dear industry uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm humbled by the honor you give me to speak in uh, such a prestigious venue here. It's been ages since, uh, since I was here. Uh, I learned the trade, uh, if I did learn anything, uh, in this great country in the late 80s and 90s, so it's great to, great to be back. Thanks, Frank, for uh, uh, the introduction and the opportunity uh, to um, tell you a little bit about ATR. Uh, ATR, A. TR stands for, you know, we in Europe like to do things slightly differently, Regional Transport Airplanes, RTA, Avion de Transport Régional. Pardon the French. It is indeed a joint venture, um, a 50-50 joint venture between uh, Airbus, and yes, I'm an Airbus apparatchik, uh, uh, Frank reminded us, and, uh, and Leonardo. Leonardo is the latest name of uh, the uh, Italian aerospace and defense firm formerly known as Finn Meccanica. Um, before I tell you too much and, uh, and uh, confuse you with my strange accent, um, allow me to show you a little video we just uh, recently did two years ago. My predecessor uh, uh, had the great idea of sending actually an ATR to North America for a little demo tour, and here's a little clip that repositions, hopefully, our product in your minds. Very short, but you got a glimpse of our airplane. You even got a glimpse of our latest customer in this great country. More about that in a short moment. Allow me to uh, uh, bore you just a little bit with some facts and data about uh, ATR, about how we're organized. Uh, uh, I will allow myself to give you a little bit of a product pitch of uh, why turboprops are indeed a very modern and contemporaneous proposition economically and not an old diesel truck from the past. Um, so we'll talk about the market in a little bit and then I'll submit myself to your uh, very uh, astute questions and, and do my best to respond to them. So ATR at a glance, our, um, our history dates back to uh, the 1980s. In fact, we just celebrated our 35 years of, um, of doing business. It was launched in 19... 81, and the amazing thing is, uh, and I say this very modestly because I only joined ATR a year and a half ago, um, the amazing thing is that the design of this airplane, which by the way was designed by the same chief engineer who also designed the Concorde, 
So you see the contrast here in perception. Um, economically, this is much better. <laughs> um, Technology-wise is uh, what I meant to say. Uh, so in, since the early 80s, there really has not been anybody, including ourselves, able to come up with a proposition of a regional transport aircraft that actually beats the economic efficiency of this very machine. I'll tell you more about that later. So ATR is a, is a very proven product at this point that took off with a 50-seater module, 45 to 50 seat, the ATR 42, and was quickly complemented, as you can see here in, in 86, by a, the ATR 72, a stretched version, therefore more efficient version of the airplane. We're up to the third generation now of upgrades of uh, this product. The fundamental aerodynamic design remains the same. The aerostructure is an incredibly light uh, aerostructure, but we're up to our third generation of propulsion system with our great partners from Pratt & Whitney Canada. Um, avionics and fully integrated avionics suite, so it's a very, very contemporaneous cockpit, uh, save for the, uh, the, control, the control column, which we still have. Uh, provided by uh, our partner Thales. You can see here some of the milestones. What I'd really like to insist on, uh, rather than go too far back in history, is our most recent achievements, and, and this is the point I really wanted to make here in the US. Uh, we were extremely gratified, and, and I, I, I really mean those words, extremely gratified uh, to uh, be able to conclude a major transaction with Federal Express for a brand new freighter version of the airplane last year. In fact, uh, uh, Greg, uh, Greg Hall uh, is here. Uh, Greg, I think we can say you and I had a little bit to do with this. I don't know who was mommy, who was daddy, but uh, uh, within uh, eight months, we, um, we responded to the invitation of FedEx to see if we could develop a factory freighter version of our airplane. Uh, we did, and we were gratified by the vote of confidence of the, the great FedEx uh, for a major, major transaction. And then I alluded to earlier, you saw a glimpse of it in the, in the video um, very early this year, admittedly maybe more towards the tail end of last year. Uh, we, uh, we also concluded a, a, an agreement with uh, Silver Airways, a uh, Florida-based uh, regional carrier known to most of you, also represented here. I'm glad to see uh, Jason there president, but also Sami Taitanen, who was then their CEO. Uh, you guys have your fingerprints on our comeback in the passenger market uh, in the United States, and thank you very much for that. Um, the, the third latest major milestone that I, I throw at you here that we're pretty proud of, uh, and it's symbolically important, I think, is that we, we um, with our turboprop product, are now achieving penetration into a new breed of customers. Uh, this is why I refer to, um, I, I point out uh, our transaction with Indigo, arguably uh, one of the world's most efficient low-cost carriers uh, in, in India. Uh, and uh, Indigo did place a major order with ATR last year. The reason this is important, and I allow myself to brag about it a little bit, is that uh, it t tells you that somebody who operates A320s in this particular case uh, with uh, seat costs per ASK of, you know, I don't want to, the, the rough order of magnitude, let's say, is five cents yeah, per, per ASK. Somebody like that has now seen the opportunity to do the same with the much smaller unit, the turboprop, arguably also a less productive asset because it flies slower, but you can achieve uh, asymptotically the same cost, operating costs on these turboprops than you can on the most efficient uh, single aisle aircraft flying out there, which you'll allow me to say is the A320 and A321. Uh, so so we seeing, we're seeing a, a renaissance, and that's really the point I wanted to make, of the turboprop aircraft, we believe, in the world market. 1,700 orders over the lifespan of the program. Frank, you pointed that out. That's where we stand today. A couple of key figures. 
just for the hell of it, 1,700 orders. We repeated it now several times. We've got a good solid backlog for a company our size. Uh, our size is roughly, we're two billion uh, per year company in terms of turnover. I'd say uh, you can work out the price of the airplane a little too easy if I say this, but I'll say it nonetheless. About 350 or so million of that two billion is services, the rest being aircraft. Um, so you, uh, you can see our backlog is about 250 airplanes. Um, we produce 80 airplanes per year, so we have a reasonable time span in front of us uh, to conduct our business. Our market share is a uh, yeah, very rewarding 75%. Uh, we're not obsessed with market share. We do have one direct competitor. It's our friends from Bombardier with the uh, Dash 8 uh, 400. Uh, a very, very nice aircraft that, that does not respond to the economic proposition that we bring to the market, hence our very, uh, our very strong market share uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years or so. More notably, 200 customers around the world, or I should say operators around the world, uh, flying our aircraft in, in, a, in 100 countries. So you'd see for a relatively modestly sized company, uh, our spread is enormous. And that was really um, the biggest uh, discovery I had coming from big mothership Airbus to ATR is to see the variety of our customers, the variety of operating environments that we're facing is actually much larger than in the jet world. So we like to think of ourselves as a very agile company and very adaptable company. Industrially, yeah, we are an industrial organization. We flyers always like to dream of airplanes, but fundamentally we're an industrial organization. We're headquartered in Toulouse, France. Uh, right in Airbus City, uh, not surprisingly. Our design office is largely linked uh, to Airbus, and we're very gratified, of course, as, um, uh, as ATR to, uh, to have the uh, proverbial Airbus inside label, um, which is what <laughs> helped us develop a brand new freighter version in less than nine months. Um, couldn't do that without the support of our shareholder Airbus, obviously. Um, you can see the wings are built by an Airbus affiliate, Stelia, in Bordeaux. The fuselages come uh, fully assembled but not loaded out of Naples, Italy. Uh, the engines uh, come uh, from uh, Montreal. The props do come from a nearby town, uh, a company that was since acquired by, by UTC. Um, from uh, Fijac, and it all comes together in Toulouse, France, where the assembly lines, as I mentioned, produce about 80 airplanes currently per year. That's how we're set up uh, organizationally. Our big industrial partners, I mentioned Thales on the avionics suite earlier, our landing gears uh, are uh, Safran. Uh, we have uh, Honeywell um, and various uh, components of the airplane, most notably the air conditioning system uh, currently. Uh, so we are, I would say, part of the usual uh, club or ecosystem of our industry. Our presence, I mentioned 200 customers, 100 countries. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, yeah, we have emancipated ourselves from what some would call a slightly provincial city of Toulouse in southwestern France. Uh, we have presence around the world. Never mind the detail here, but Miami here is our America's base. In Miami, we have customer support capability. We have a, a, a more than a help desk. We actually have support engineering capability. We've recently inaugurated a training center, a full flight simulator, maybe a second one. Keep buying airplanes, Greg, yeah, would you, and, uh, and Jason? Um, uh, so we, we will most probably have two simulators before too long in Miami. Uh, we have a, a spares warehouse, uh, uh, obviously, and, and our, our business representation, our sales representation for North and South America and Miami. To lose our home base, we have a sim and, and spares distribution center in Paris. We recently inaugurated Paris to avoid forcing our customers to fly down to Toulouse, connecting down to Toulouse for the sake of efficiency. 
Uh, we have a sim in Johannesburg, moving east to uh, Bangalore. We have a small support, growing support presence uh, for our Indian customers. Um, we have more than just Indigo. We have four airlines operating our airplanes in India. Singapore is a big um, ASEAN, let's call it, uh, or Southern Asian uh, base, uh, fully autonomous base, very empowered, big logistics center in Singapore, training facility obviously as well. Uh, and then we will have more flight simulators as we expand our market presence. We'll have one in, in Tokyo in association with Japan Airlines who gratified us with an order about a year and a half ago. Uh, we will invest into China, which is still virgin territory for our product. Admittedly, if we peek over the Great Wall of China, we see a domestic product being pitched at the airlines there, so that may have something to do with our lack of penetration so far, but we're hopeful that the efficiency and proven track record of our aircraft will allow us to deliver into China in great numbers in the future. Big customer down in New Zealand as well, Air New Zealand, one of our uh, most uh, stellar airline partners with, uh, with a big support capability there as well. So you can see worldwide presence, um, which uh, for a company our size uh, makes it an interesting management challenge to uh, maintain a high level of support and presence in all these places around the world. Um, so market, this is where if you allow me, I'll brag a little bit about our product um, uh, because we, you know, we don't just give away models. Sometimes we can cut you a good deal on real airplanes as well. Here, here are our two airplanes. The one thing I, I would like to point out is that at, the, at this point, the only, the only 50 seat aircraft in production today is actually the ATR-42, the smaller one, the smaller brother of these two. Uh, the uh, CRJs, the 50-seat CRJs are no longer being produced. There aren't any uh, old uh, ERJs being produced either. So the only 50-seat aircraft available in the market today is the ATR-42. And then this is the biggest, the bigger brother, the 72, which constitutes admittedly about 80 to 90% of our sales today. Now, let's take a little bit of a closer look at uh, how we position the airplane. Why is this turboprop airplane so successful in a world that uh, doesn't even see turboprops very much anymore, right? We're all obsessed with our jets. Um, why is this airplane so successful? Well, you know better than I do what the operating economics of an airline are. You know, it's, it's fuel, it's labor, and it's capital cost. If you take a look at fuel, which is the number one chapter of cost of the operating e economics or equation of our customers, versus the competing turboprop, we save 40% on fuel and maintenance uh, alone, 40%. You know, most of us in the OEM world, and there's quite a few colleagues around here that know what I'm talking about. I mean, we kill each other for 2%, never mind 40%. So our fuel bill compared to our turboprop competitors, uh, uh, the Q, uh, is gonna be 40% less as well in maintenance because our airplane, every time it takes off, takes off with seven tons less weight than our direct competitor. Versus the jet, no comparison, you know, the, the fuel bill uh, is only 80% less. Um, so that's how we market our product. Uh, on the trip cost, on total integrated trip cost, because we're a fairly frugal uh, airplane, we can save 20% versus our turboprops, that's how we market ourselves, and 45% against the jet, which if you bring it down to a seat cost, um, because we are 72, typically 72 seat, we can push it to 78 seat on the larger module. Uh, the Q400 or the uh, 90 seat jets are therefore slightly larger than we are. That dilutes that trip cost advantage down to an absolutely astonishing 10% versus competing turboprops and 20% versus jets. So that in very simple numbers is why the turboprop has a bright future in front of it. All we need, I shouldn't say this, I actually don't even mean it, but 
I was going to say, all we need is a little hike in fuel prices, and these numbers will become even bigger. But I don't think there's anybody in this room that has an interest vested in high fuel prices. So I'll refrain from that. I'll just ride the wave when it happens. Um, so that's how, we pitch, uh, that's how we pitch our product, and that's why we're so incredibly successful in terms of uh, market share. Now, I, I said earlier, we're not this old uh, uh, diesel truck. Uh, no, this is a very contemporaneous airplane. As I mentioned, it's Airbus inside, fully integrated avionics suite. This is what the cockpit of an ATR looks like. It's hardly a caravan or something or a King Air or something of, of, of that kind. The latest uh, avionics we've introduced in this airplane and we keep upgrading it, uh, of course, allow VNAV, it, they allow uh, precision navigation approaches. We've developed that with Air New Zealand. It's going into service just now. And we're coming out next year with a pretty sexy uh, feature, which is a, a helmet-mounted HUD system, allowing our operators uh, to fly into, uh, into thick fog, rain, et cetera. It's a, a system we call Clear Vision that we've developed with our good partners of Elbit in, uh, in uh, Israel. So it's a, it's a very, very sexy feature we will bring to the market uh, imminently. Uh, so state-of-the-art cockpit, uh, and again, not the old lorry. Uh, with the cabin, it's a very contemporaneous cabin. I take no credit for it. My predecessors have uh, spruced up this cabin to make it uh, uh, quite modern. Uh, in terms of seat width and volume per passenger, it's actually better than the small regional jets our airplanes pretend to replace. Uh, and it is comparable to what you would see in the more modern regional jets, the 90 seat, 100 seat, 130 seat modules. Uh, going forward. Very quiet cabin, yes, yes, the turboprop is actually a quieter airplane than a jet airplane. Uh, we see some operators flying our airplane into domestic airports, into city airports where jets are prohibited because of noise barriers. Uh, and we've recently introduced some lightweight seats. Actually, uh, I think our colleagues at Boeing have, have since um, uh, um, uh, adopted uh, the same seat technology that we've introduced with titanium seats, which took as much as 300 kilograms out of a 70-seat cabin uh, just recently. Wi-Fi streaming, LED lighting, da-da-da-da-da, you see, you get the point, it's a modern airplane. Also in the cabin, you might say, yeah, the little turboprop, uh, how about carry-ons? <laughs> this is our bin. Sorry for, for those who might think this is a little esoteric, but as we talk to our airline customer, this is quite important. You can bring roller bags and store them in the bins that we have in our cabin. You don't even need to duck as you walk down the aisle. You can stand up. Now, fuel burn, that's great. Uh, uh, landing weights, charges, etc. What does it all mean? Uh, you know, I'm not here to compare my airplane to, to other airplanes. I'm here to, to um, uh, market it around the world. And, and this, is, this is proof of why it works. Um, last year alone, in 2017 alone, 155 new routes have been created with ATR airplanes in the installed fleet uh, of airplanes uh, around the world. Um, even in the Americas, at the risk of not being able to tell you where exactly, I understand, in North America, uh, US, Canada, uh, 20 new routes were opened flying ATR airplanes last year. And that's good news because we all know, particularly in, in, in the US here, that we have lost community links, we have lost regional air service to the tune of about 300 routes that were dropped in the last five years that have no longer been flown. Hopefully we see a reversal of this trend you can see on average about 100 new routes are being opened with ATR aircraft around the world. So that's why we believe that this uh, turboprop technology uh, is, has a, a bright future. In fact, I'll make the personal bet at the risk of sounding a bit controversial that we will see more propellers in the future on more modules. And propellers aren't a thing of the past. Pro the propeller, I remind everyone here, is the most efficient propulsion 
solution for aircraft there is. It's infinitely, by definition, infinitely more efficient than a ducted propeller, which uh, the turbofan engine is. Come back. What do we see the market potential for ourselves and our competitors? We see about 2,800 airplanes over uh, this time span between now and 2035. Uh, about 1,800 of those will be growth, in particular also on the freight side. Uh, Greg, I hope you set off an avalanche here uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with your uh, decision. Uh, so 1,800 new airplanes uh, going into growth into disenclaving, into more community services, opening new island uh, services in the Caribbean uh, uh, with uh, you guys at Silver and uh, Bahamas, Caribbean, uh, but also Indonesia, other archipelagos uh, that would develop with these kind of airplanes. A replacement of about 1,000 airplanes for a total of 2,800. You can see the regional split here. And yes, in North America, we see a sizable 16% of, uh, of, of uh, total turboprop applications, less than 100 seats, less than 90 seats to be precise, uh, between now and 2035. So we have a very profitable business and we could see it going on for a while so long as we do a good job supporting our customers and bringing in incremental um, uh, innovations into the product. I'm nearly done bragging. So, um, to conclude, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I want to uh, thank our 200 operators and customers around the world. You can see them nicely spread here with a couple of blank areas in China and Russia, but we're working to, to uh, correct that. Uh, and I thank you very, very much for your attention. Be glad to answer questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, at one point, there was a ATR-90 on the drawing board. Has there been any further discussion about that airplane? Uh, thank you. Uh, good question. Yes, it's true to say that our two shareholders have had um, slightly not opposing views, but unaligned views as to the future product development. Our Italian shareholder was pushing very much uh, for us to do, let's call it an ATR-92. 90-seater, the one you refer to. Uh, Airbus was a little more cautious, saying, hey, I probably have better things to do with my money than to do another uh, airplane. Was the drawing board at Airbus was pretty full. Um, at this point, uh, you know, I have to be honest with you. I, I think the prospect of doing a 90-seater based on these platforms is, I think that's pretty much off the table uh, currently. Um, you, my personal view, and I pushed for that uh, to be the case, is that if you look at the regional market, the place is crowded as you approach 90 and 100 seats. Okay, it's crowded with jets, but you know these people are beating each other up and nobody makes any money in that market segment. So do you want to add another module in there, even though it's a slightly differentiated module on the uh, with the turboprop proposition, hmm, probably not. That's point one. Point two is if you look at between now and the horizon line, I don't know what that is, you know, but in our industry it's uh, 10 years, 12 years. Between now and the horizon line that we can see, is there a likelihood of our position being challenged? I hope I'm not being complacent by saying probably not. Yeah, there's probably not anybody out there who's going to throw a new, new turboprop at us based on current technologies. If you look, if you take a peek a little bit beyond the horizon line, now we can start thinking about ruptured technologies that are already bubbling and being talked about uh, on the propulsion. Frank and I were chatting about it a moment ago on the propulsion side. Um, the other big cost chapter, labor on the cockpit side. Can you take labor out of the operation of an airplane? I say this cautiously. Uh, on the manufacturing side, capital cost, the digital revolution should enable us to 
Institute for Manufacturing Technologies and Industrial Setups that are a step change more efficient than what we would be able to do with current technology. So that's a long answer to a short question, but we believe when we look at the, the deck of cards, technology, competitive, market, we, we feel no, probably not a 90-seater in the immediate future. Does that make sense? Do you sell a lot of those uh, 42s in a business configuration at all? In the in a business as a bizjet? Yes, sir. 135. Uh, no. How many would you like? Ten. <laughs> I'm thinking of a, I, a nice little this. airport to fly into called Aspen. Yeah. Oh yes. I think yes. it'd be great for that. Oh uh, well. And uh, a bunch of other ski destinations too. Sure. No. All kidding aside, we do see, and, and thank you for your question. Uh, on the BizJet side, I have to say, this is uh, sort of very marginal for us. We've had some, some military, paramilitary applications like Coast Guard airplanes or surveillance airplanes. We've had some, but really, I don't think more than a handful of, of uh, corporate or private uh, uh, type applications. That's not to say we don't want to pursue it, absolutely, yeah. Um, Please find me on the way out. The, um, um, the point, though, that uh, your question uh, reminds me I wanted to make is that because we're the only 50-seat uh, airplane that you can buy new factory fresh, um, we see a real opportunity in actually catching a, a major replacement wave of 50-seaters, but also smaller airplanes. And if you don't mind me saying this, Jason, uh, uh, Jason's the president of Silver. Um, I think Silver and ATR got into uh, uh, our, our agreement because we were able to demonstrate, hopefully, that we, with this ATR 42, the 50-seater, we can have the same operating cost signature than airlines that airlines experience today with a much smaller airplane. In, in the case of Silver, the Saab 340, it's a 30-plus-seater. So we can bring basically 20 more seats to our customer, quote unquote, for free, because of the, the, the efficiency of our airplane. And, and that's what gives us a lot of hope in the market of the ATR 42, even though today it's only 15% of what we produce, um, because we see this replacement wave of all these 30, 35, 40 seat airplanes coming at us. Um, and, and so we're, we're currently thinking about uh, reinvigorating our marketing on the ATR 42. I'd love to come and demonstrate it in Aspen, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have one more question. Okay. Hi, Christian. Thank you for your talk today. Um, Sophie Siegel from Flight Global. Just wondered if you could comment briefly on um, obviously, you said that uh, you see about 16% market share in the US. You did the deal with Silver Airways. Um, Maybe you could comment on, on where, what routes you see um, in need of ATR aircraft and what, what customers might be um, out there. Well, I, uh, thank you. I knew this difficult question would come. And, and at, the risk, at the risk of um, coming across as candid or blue-eyed here to you, um, I'll say maybe we just have forgotten about, in the, in the US, forgotten about the economic signature of these turboprops. We've conceded to the jet mania of the 1990s uh, when fuel prices were extremely low. The competition between the various offerings on the jet side was such that it created accessibility to, to uh, the ERJs, the CRJs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so allow me to give you a slightly general, if not Jesuit type of answer. I, uh, I do believe it's going to be hard work that with the economic signature we provide into this deregulated, the most deregulated airline environment in the world, people would be mad not to look at operating turboprops. The difficulty we have in, in the US is, of course, that the ground infrastructure is very advanced, uh, roads, uh, trains, etc. and you Americans love to hop in a car and sit in it for five hours. Uh, 
in, instead of going through the aggravation of uh, you know going to the airport to secure da 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 da, da. but. But as we look at the economic signature of this airplane, and as we look at replacing the Saabs uh, in the, the Saab 340s, 2000s, but also the 50-seat jets, um, I think we can attract a lot of attention, be it from the major airlines uh, uh, who uh, will look at the economics that their, uh, their regional uh, partners provide to them, but also from the purely regional um, uh, airlines. So I think the, the numbers will speak, will speak for themselves. I'm not going to risk <laughs> giving you names, but it is our ambition to, and this is why we've, we've done this demo tour, it is our ambition to put ourselves back, at least on the analytical radar of the major US carriers, um, uh, by, simply by virtue of the economic benefit we can provide. And, and as I mentioned before, sorry, Frank, as I mentioned before, in this country alone, 300 routes were dropped. You know, 300 routes, communities no longer have air service because the, the carriers withdrew and, and concentrated on the massive growth of air travel in the bigger modules, which is understandable. You know, it's a more efficient way to allocate your capital. As the market is, uh, matures, perhaps flattens out on the, on the main networks, we believe we'll see an opportunity to reopen uh, smaller community services in the country. Thank you. Christian, thank you. You're very, very uh, welcome. I would like to present you with this plaque. It reads, presented to Christian Scherer in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, New York, May 2018. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks for having me.